there's no note here that it wasn't. Better? All right. Start with a roll call. Brooks. Here. Mike. Here. Brian. Talk loud. Here. 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 Thomas. Here. Alyssa. Here. Rob. Here. Perfect. We have a quorum. Item number three, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Motion is second to approve the agenda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number four, approval of minutes of the May 18th, 2023 regular meeting. I believe there's a typo. Oh, boy. Here uh, we go. In the paragraph about the public hearing on the uh, in-city properties, mailing notices, uh, it says co Commissioner Heidrich seconded, Commissioner Nichols seconded. They both seconded. Yeah, one of them, the first one should say moved, I suppose. You guys want to flip a coin to see who's who? Wrestling match? Okay. All right. Motion to approve with those changes? Okay. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number five public comments. Anybody wishing to address the commission may do so now, unless you are on the agenda and we will get to you in a minute. Anyone? Okay. Item number six, uh, conditional use application for 609 East Willow Street. This looks like Viaflex. Is there someone here to speak to that? Come on up. Just there it is. Okay, just go ahead. There we go. Okay, uh, my name is Troy Naus of four zero four North Crestview Drive here in Brandon. And I also work for Viaflex representing this request. Okay. What would you like to do? So right now we have one entrance to the east side of our property. And we would like to add a second entrance towards the west side of our property. And the reason being is uh, we are starting up production. And we will have roughly 10 to 12 trucks per day we think are going to come in on average. And, you know, with the lows and highs, we could have maybe 15 plus trucks someday. And right now, the way it is, we don't have room in our parking lot for these trucks to come in, turn around and exit again. And okay. so by adding this second entrance, they'll be able to come in and then drive back out again without turning around. Okay. And they're here because we don't allow for two driveways on one street frontage, correct? Correct. In the packet, there is an exception for driveways that says for R3, CB, GB, LI, HI, and institutional. Each lot is allowed one driveway per street frontage. The width of each driveway shall not exceed 60 feet as measured at the inside of the sidewalk. Each additional driveway shall require a conditional use permit. So okay. this is a conditional use permit hearing for the second driveway. Okay. Does anybody here have any questions for Mr. Knaus? Any comments or questions from the board? Remember to use your mics if you do. Yes, sir. So is, are you planning on paving the front of your property there so that the trucks coming in can go over to the second driveway? It How won't be there? fully paved. Um, it'll just be paved as it comes on and off the street. We'll have a small area of concrete where we put our overhead door in, and then the rest will be gravel. Which does fit building code, correct? For heavy yep. Industrial. For heavy industrial, it does, yeah. Yep. Driveway approach up to the property line. 
has to be art service, which they're going to do. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? I do. Hold on. Hold on. Brian first. Yes, sir. Uh, what's the distance from the site there? The, to our property line? I believe it's like 60 feet. The way that it's drawn in is the finished grade is parallel or run, yeah, runs parallel with the edge of our building. And I believe that we're 60 feet off the lot line. That was one question I wanted to ask is how far off of the lot line do we have to stay? Paul? For a driveway, is it five feet? Ten. Ten? Okay, so the driveway could go within 10 feet of the lot line, as well as the graded surface? That is correct, yes. Okay. From the property line, for the driveway. Yes. Perfect. Okay. There is a... There is a property to your west currently, correct? Yep. Not for the image here, correct? Yep. There is they, a building on that. have two driveways, correct? Yep. There be, and I think their lot, their driveway is pretty close to that lot line as well. Um, Melissa, do you have a question? Is there more than one building that has Viflex sign in front of it? No, only no? one. No? Because, all right, I drove up there today, and I suppose this doesn't have anything to do with the driveway. But I, I'm i confused, and I want to make sure that I'm not confused anymore because it takes up too much room in my head. Sure. All right. So this building that's around the corner, that one, is the one I looked at, that, that one. I thought it had... A sign in front of it that said your business name. No, that is Henkel. Yeah. Well, then, what the heck? I'll, I'll go back up there and there you go. look at it again and see what I was looking at. Okay. okay. Thanks. And then, I think it's Paradigm just to our west. I'm not aware of anybody talking directly with them, but, you know, obviously to be a good neighbor, we would talk to them about how close we go to the property line and stuff like that. Okay. Anybody else have any questions or concerns? No. Would anybody like to make a motion? Make a motion to approve the request upon two conditions. That okay. meets the uh, minimum setback from the property line, and that is not to exceed 30 feet as indicated in the application. I heard the first one meet the setback. Where's the second one, sir? Not, not ex to exceed 30 feet wide. For the application. Okay. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the conditional use with two conditions. Any other discussion? What was the second condition? Sorry. So we allow for 60 feet of driveway, and you already have 30, so he's just requesting that the other one be 30 to match it. Okay. That is the measurement right behind the um, well, easement. Well, in the application. It yeah, 30 feet. The width of his existing. Okay. Okay. And I thought there was a second condition as well. Not to encroach on the minimum setback, which is 10 feet. Okay. Okay. Which we would control with the building permit anyway when he comes out. Okay. Anybody else have any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. There you go. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. I would now need a motion to, do we adjourn the planning and zoning? Is that right? Correct. You would reconvene at the Board of Adjustment. Okay. So I need a motion to adjourn the planning and zoning commission. Second. Motion is second. Motion second for Melissa. Okay. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Now I will reconvene the um, Board of Adjustments with a call to order. We've already determined our quorum. 
Uh, item number nine, I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda for the Board of Adjustments. So second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 10, which makes no sense, but here we are for public comments again. So if you would like to make public comments, please do so now. Okay. Item number 11. Let me get to the right page here. So um, similarly, this I've is a request for an additional driveway. The difference here is LI has a different rule than R1. Sure. For R1, the standard is unless otherwise specified below, which it's not specified below, each lot shall have one driveway that does not exceed 40 feet wide as measured at the inside of the sidewalk. This is a request for a second driveway on a R1 lot. That's why it's going the variance route instead of a conditional use route. So the checklist sure. and all that stuff applies. Okay. Um, is there anybody here to speak to this? Mark? You, Mark? Yes, sir. Come on up. If you give us your name and address, that would be wonderful. Yep. Uh, Mark Kwasny, 1600 West Riverbend here in Brandon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, so I am requesting this variance today uh, for a number of reasons. So we, we built the house on a, a beautiful corner lot in the Bluffs neighborhood. Um, we encountered a couple of issues, uh, both due to the grade and the specific layout of the lot. Um, the grade uh, grades dramatically towards the north uh, and a, a lesser grade. Uh, towards the west, but still uh, a pretty significant grade, which made the ideal building site for the home uh, that southeast corner. Uh, but I have a requirement that I have three stall garages for this development. So we turned the house every single which way to try and get those three stall garages uh, al aligned with each other. And we kept running into because we have the 25 foot setbacks as well as the grade uh, on the two 25 foot setbacks and then as well as the grade. It, uh, we couldn't get a tenable position, so we ended up with an L-shaped garage. Uh, we then debated uh, which way to put the driveway, um, and we ended up on what we were here so that the garage would face uh, Riverbend Street, which is the front of the house, and it would make sense with the address and everything uh, to not cause any confusion. We've lived in the home now since October. We've encountered a number of safety issues that are leading us to want to uh, put in this second driveway to ease the approach. Uh, first, so the, the driveway that's to the left, uh, or the, the garage that's to the left, uh, is the primary garage for our primary vehicles. Uh, to enter it uh, most safely, you end up having to back into the driveway and then come around. Um, Pulling in forward with uh, uh, our vehicles uh, leads to uh, a lot of back and forth and back and forth. Um, so we end up having to pull and wait for traffic, and there, there gets to be a little bit of traffic congestion at times. If people are coming by, they're not exactly sure what we're trying to do there. Uh, that's the first issue. The second safety issue is then is that I have a blind corner as I'm coming out of my garage. The walk up to my home is right there, and so we have to. Uh, watch out for small children. We love the neighborhood. There's a lot of children. They're always running around uh, playing with each other. So we have to be very careful uh, that with that blind corner that we're not endangering any children. We decided let's just solve the issue and, and try and see if we can get this second driveway approach uh, put in, which would make access easier and safer for our home. So okay. that I'll stand by for any questions. Um, is there a Google image? This is it. Both of them are not up to date as we would like, sure. and they both show just kind of a bare lot. But the For roads are in, right? Mini map and Google Maps. I think Sioux Falls's parcel map has my home, but not my um, driveways. If that's any better for you. <clears throat> you are already on the county GIS. Correct. That's this. Yeah. And there's Google Maps. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, when you go on Google Maps, can you, if you put on Street View, will it actually go onto the street? No, oh, we can look. And show us anything? That'd be nice. Eh. I don't have nope. one there yet. No street there yet to put a guy on? Yep. 
That guy looks really pathetic when it's, <laughs> that's really bad. Oh my gosh. So you, you want to add a driveway on West Bennett Drive? Yes, it would connect into West Bennett Drive to provide a straight approach into that. And how uh, wide is your garage at that point? My gr the entire garage or the door? Yeah, it would be the double. Uh, it's 25 feet. And you're Roughly. Put a 24 foot wide driveway in? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay, so mm. this is new construction, you said? Yes, sir. We yep. moved in in October. That was okay. construction was completed at that time. You took one? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> While they're doing that, so I drove by there. Oh, sorry, Brian, if you're but and so this proposed driveway, this would feed directly toward the double doors. I mean, that's the that would be the flow, right? And yes, that's sir. The, and the existing driveway actually feeds more directly towards the extra single garage. That's correct. And makes you take a like you were describing a pretty significant <laughs> maneuver to get to the double garage door. Okay, that's correct. Yep. We thought it would make more sense to go with the front of the house with the driveway and then um, we have the pad kind of go out to facilitate the roundabout that we have to do. We thought that if we did that towards the front of the home, it would be less visually appealing when we initially made the decision to do the driveway as we did. So. <clears throat> okay, does anybody else have any questions? So just probably not questions, but comments. Um, so I'm, I'm struggling with the hardship on this. It's new construction. Um, they could have moved the house to the west, seven yard setback here. Instead, they put it at about 14 feet. Um, the east setback could have been reduced to 20 foot. He mentioned 25. Um, so, or the primary driveway could have been put on Bennett to serve the double stalls, leaving a wider access into the third stall. So I'm, I'm struggling to find a hardship on brand new construction. Uh, I was just gonna actually revisit this. So uh, we do have a new member that hasn't been through the variance process yet. So we have a checklist. I mean, I won't point out to who the new member is, but we have a, it's in your packet, it's a checklist that basically is what guides us through this process. Um, I believe you were probably given that. Yes, sir. Should have been given that? Okay. So where we sometimes struggle on this board finding a hardship is an, an unnecessary hardship refers solely to the particular physical condition of the property, not any personal or self-inflicted hardship of its owner, financial or otherwise, the hardship must be substantial and of compelling force, not merely for reasons of convenience or profit, and must render the ability to use the land unfeasible without the variance. So that is what that guides us through this process. And so that is the question that we have to be able to answer. Um, if we grant the hardship, does it does it strip you of the ability to use the land? Um, uh, let me see here. If I could provide a little more color on some of that. So sure. as you can see, West, West Bennett curves. It starts to curve and that pushes the... Uh, the 25 foot setback and so then when you couple that curve with the uh, grade that happens there which becomes fairly steep on that west side we've smoothed it out as much as we can 
it would put the house in a position where it was difficult to to build the home with how we would have had to push the house and so trying to maximize the use of the land and make the house as stable as possible this ended up being the best position for the home and the garage and so um, I think the 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 curvature as well as the the grades um, contributed to the need to so item number D of this also says the literal interpretation of this zoning provision deprives the applicant of the following rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the same districts under the terms of the ordinance. So I guess for discussion is for some reason is the interpretation of this zoning provision depriving the applicant of the rights of other properties in the area. I don't know. There are two additional homes in my neighborhood that have two driveway approaches as well that are on corner lots. Well, one's on a corner lot at 1700 West Ashton. Another one's on West Thomas Circle. It has two driveway approaches on that cul-de-sac as well. Do we know why those were allowed? I do, I do not. I think it was. Yep. So that's the first one. Um, maybe, yes. Yeah, I'm familiar with that one. I'm familiar with them, but... Then the other one would be closer towards the entrance to the development. Uh, no, not that one. It's right West there. Ashton Circle right on the corner, sir. Yep. <laughs> So that do it, it was before the current staff's sure. job here. Okay. Hmm. So I would also look at H. Uh, the exceptional and extraordinary circumstances that apply to the property that do not apply to other properties in the same zone or vicinity and then result from the lot size or shape, topography or other circumstances which are not of the applicant's making. So, I mean, this is not, I would say, a typical lot. Maybe it is. I'm not a developer, but... So from a staff perspective, presuming those two properties with the two driveways did things correctly when they applied, they probably did so before our zoning ordinance changed. Correct. So you, given the language now, the second driveway would be a non-conforming driveway. If they came in now to get rid of it and then add a different one, it would not be allowed to be rebuilt. It would be a non-conforming use. So that uh, that speaks to G. Yeah. So over the over the years, the the zoning ordinance constantly gets revisited and changed and tweaked and whatever, right? So that would have complied with the zoning ordinance that was in place at the time that the house was built. Since then, the ordinance has been changed for some reason. Um, so does anybody else have any comments? Any thoughts on this? You say that um, going up to F there, where it talks about safety and panic and other things, you're saying that backing in and out of there is dangerous to kids? From your house and from neighbors, it's the way it's, it is now. I would say it's dangerous uh, when you know when you stop and you have to back in. Cars don't know what you're doing. You create uh, some traffic issues. There are a lot of kids that run through the neighborhood, uh, and then it's dangerous that there's a blind corner that exists uh, coming around uh, that uh, swinging around the drive. And you mentioned uh, the first one there. 
some congestion in the streets when you were doing all this? Yes, sir. Yeah. Cars have to stop and wait for us to get backed in um, if they approach and we don't, if they approach as we're backing in. Okay. Can I see the street where the lot is again, please? It's right there. Okay, right on that corner. Put the mouse where the house is, right there. Yes. Okay, cross the street from that, that way. Yeah, that's an empty lot. I, I can see sometime in the future us sitting here talking to the owner of that lot for asking for a second driveway also, which doesn't which we don't take into consideration when we grant or not grant this one, but... Yep. The topography there is much flatter. Uh, they don't have the grade change on the end of their lots that kind of forced us into the corner uh, and then limited us on how we could situate our three stall garages. I don't remember why we would have changed the ordinance when we did. I know that I have seen houses situated on corner lots with driveways coming off of both circle drives coming off of both ways. I don't know if it adds to safety or not. I can't really speak to that, I guess, but. I, would, I don't know, like when you go, just to use an example, these executive homes, a lot of them have a lot of double driveways. And you go to these bigger areas, I mean, not, not saying the bluffs is executive, but they're, we're gonna get that someday. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna run into this for sure. I know on those type of houses where they're gonna, a lot of those are gonna want that circle driveway with the grand entrance. If the checklist on the variance makes this an issue, is this something we would entertain through a text amendment? Explain if, that to me. If this is going to be a potentially a reoccurring problem and a variance has its limitations by the checklist, is this something you would be interested in addressing through a text amendment? Whether it's a corner lot, you can get a second driveway by conditional use, or however you want to talk through it. Not presuming how you'll vote either way, but providing commentary. I would say a corner, myself, personally, I think a corner lot is a different situation than a normal straight-on lot. When you're, cause you can position a house a lot of ways on a corner lot compared to a normal straight on to a front of a street. To, okay. To get, if, if you were trying to purposely get a double driveway, you could. Two is what I'm saying, getting at. We have a lot of instances with double frontage, not necessarily corner lots. Uh, we have some that are front and back because they have an additional yep. garage in the back. Um, but as of right now, we have to go by what's in our ordinance. We we have to if if a, if a hardship is not proven then yes we have to listen to our ordinance can we change our ordinance anytime we want so there are some arguments that can be made I think for a hardship but there's also some that that are these by the way are the hardest thing that we do as a board is to hear variance hearings. I understand and appreciate um, your position. The, the process is, is very difficult to prove a hardship. Um, and if we do approve variances, then we start thinking about whether or not we have to change ordinances to match up with the variance that we just approved or didn't, didn't approve. Um, 
theoretically, if enough of them come before us, then we start thinking maybe we should change the ordinance. Um, and once you issue a variance, you pretty much have to do a change that locks the door. It does make things a little trickier, I guess. Does anybody else have any comments, have you questions? Looked at putting switching your double garage so instead of coming in from the east coming in from the south how deep is your garage then you'd have three single stall doors but instead of putting in another driveway coming all your having all your driveway come off of the south make make my driveway from the south wider is that yeah what and then then move your door a double move your double door around to the south and have two single doors on the south? Is your the, garage deep enough for that? N no, sir. The I could. So you're saying having the garage that faces south have that be my double door? Yeah. Uh, it's it's already it's already built. It's not wide enough. And then if I made it any wider, I would encroach that setback on the east side of the home. Maybe I'm not understanding. Yeah. So on the south on the south side where you currently have a wall if you had your door there I'm just there was there, some of this is more design than because you wanted the aesthetics of from the south your house looks nicer without having garage doors there but if you had had all your garage doors on the south side aesthetically it might not have been as pleasing but you could have had your driveway work a lot better could have actually got four stalls in there That's you know that's you know, there was there were some things that could have been done differently that could have worked aesthetically it wouldn't have looked as nice for you but so it's it's wider than it is deep and so if I would turn it to have three appropriately sized stalls I would buy I wouldn't well you could still leave your single one where it's at so it wouldn't change anything going east and. How how deep is it? How deep is your double stall? Twenty feet. My eighteen foot truck. I close it, and there's four inches for the door. Yeah. I'd love it to be deeper. <laughs> yeah. I don't have the space on my lot. <clears throat> do you need that? Oops. Do you need the north fit, uh, south facing driveway? Can that be removed and just have the, and then have a carriage walk come around to your front door? Uh, against the south-facing garage. Uh, if if my variance wasn't approved, I I guess I would look at that. Uh, I guess it's my thought is is you're asking me to decide which one of my garages I should limit the usability of, um, and I understand that I have the lot and I built it and that's that's the choice that I'm faced with, but. Um, it would limit the usability that I'd have the same issue with that other trying to get you know trailers backed in and other things because I can't have those parked on the street or anything like that so <clears throat> or out in front of the house on a pad that's not allowed by the code either you can if it's in the setback with the, if it's in with the setback you can park oh Okay. Does anybody else up here have any questions or concerns or comments? Yeah. The other, the other comment here. Use your mic, you please. To, Sorry. You know, as long as we're talking design options, I mean, all of these things make perfect sense. Uh, the other thing here, like I mentioned before, you don't have two 25-foot setbacks. You have a 20 and a 25 on a double front inch lock, and so your driveway could be wider to allow you to back out of that additional stall turn around and get back out into the street. I, I is that is that correct in the code that I have one twenty and one twenty five? I thought a corner lot had a twenty five and a twenty five. Correct. So you could add seven feet of pavement to your east to allow you to back out of your garage, drive out into the street forward. 
that make sense? Pull in back into your garage. Okay. Does anybody have anything regarding the variance itself? Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to deny the request. Okay. I'll second. A motion and a second to deny the request. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. I will now entertain a motion to adjourn the Board of Adjustments. A motion and a second to adjourn the Board of Adjustments. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. I will now reconvene the Planning and Zoning Commission with item number 12, um, Aspen Ridge Development Concept Plans. Page 36. Is there anybody here to speak to that? So just to provide some visual context, the land to the north across Aspen Boulevard is the golf course. So just so you're oriented where this is located. If you could just give us your name and address, that would be awesome. Press that. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Russell Atkins, 8304 South Timber Oak Circle, Sioux Falls. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for uh, listening to me today, tonight. Um, my name is Russell Atkins. I'm CEO and partner of Christensen Development Partners. We're a local owned and managed development company. I've got one of my partners here, Amy Folsom. I've got another two partners uh, on this project um, that were not able to make it tonight, Eric Christensen and Jason Bortnum. Um, we have under contract <coughs> 93 acres um, that we've got a concept plan in front of you um, has multiple zonings um, different housing um, and a couple of commercial components to it um, I believe there's um, one commercial site roughly 1.8 acres um, another commercial site uh, closer to 1.9 there's six and a half 6.7 acres of multifamily We've got a townhome parcel um, that's roughly 10 acres. We've got uh, 56, I believe, patio homes. Um, looks like 11 uh, twin home locations. And that would put us close to roughly 69, I believe, uh, single family lots. We've got 14 acres of open space, well, won't be open space, be city park is where we're headed and thinking about uh, talking to the staff about that concept as, as we speak we're looking at some pretty fun things in the park um, got a splash park that, that we're looking into and proposing probably some pickleball courts um, that in itself I think has garnered a lot of interest in those 56 patio homes to the east of the city park um, a lot of open area to walk um, We've got a few issues that we're uh, working with staff uh, to overcome uh, sewerability. Uh, we've got a plan in place with that. Um, I do have with me uh, tonight uh, my engineer from DGR. So in the event we've got any questions or things that relate to engineering, uh, bring him up here because you don't want to hear me uh, on those. Um, we've got uh, some fairly significant storm um, implications or, or storm water, excuse me, drainage uh, coming underneath Aspen Boulevard um, that we have to take into account as well in the development. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions or concerns? This is Patrick, just a discussion uh, one item. So. That when I saw this, I recently there was some discussion about having a bike trail go up to the railroad and then going across into the city. I don't know if you've been in on those conversations. I don't know how far they are, but I would probably direct that to Tammy. Yeah, the problem with the trail on the east side is that we have to get over the river somehow. Um, 
that's obviously really expensive. So out of our bike and pedestrian plan, there was a recommendation to take that bike trail across the bridge at McCarty Park and then kind of follow the bank on that side to come over and then connect into a country club. Um, I think they have some of those plans. I don't think that's really detailed out on a concept plan, but that's certainly something we would show on preliminary plan. Sure. I just didn't know if when this, I, I didn't know where that went and if that was something we could tie into here before it got too far, but there's a lot of green space there on the south side, so if you did tie into the railroad down there, there'd probably be a way to put a path in or something. So that was the only, I thought the plan looked good with the layout. I just thought about that bike path. I thought, well, maybe that's something we should. Always be looking at, yes. <clears throat> On the yes, uh, uh, townhomes, how tall are you going to make those? Or on your concept, what are you thinking? Um, anticipated probably two-story townhomes um, in there, um, mainly because there'll be slab on grades. I doubt very seriously there'll be any basements in there. Um, I, so that's I, the R3 area or the... The R, the it'd be R2. R2, the orange yeah. area up there. Yes. Okay. So on the R3, what are you going to put in there? Uh, those would be a, a fairly typical apartment uh, setup. Um, I'm sure those would be like a three-story center load. But we're us as the developer, uh, Christensen Development Partners, we would be developing the site and selling these parcels to other builders uh, oh. to come in and... and build the facilities out. We do have some interest on that parcel already. Um, they're in their due diligence, we'll be in the due diligence stage soon. Uh, Lloyd uh, Development is looking at uh, apartments there, as well as some townhomes. And the 56 patio homes, um, those are like two bedroom or what are they consist of? You know, he's got a, a fairly established product line. Um, my understanding is that those are in the four to $500,000 range, um, lower maintenance, um, if you will, uh, for the residents that live there. That area also, um, with some challenging challenges with the depth of the sewer, those will all be slab on grade construction, those 56 units. But I don't, I don't know his product well enough to know whether they're two-bedroom, three-bedroom. I've got a few questions. Um, so is this all intended to be uh, public right away? Uh, some, of the, some of the lots look like they go out into the center line of the... Right away. Yeah, I, I get confused on the, those are the zoning lines um, there, but these are all uh, public right of way. I believe 66 feet is what we, Tammy had some comments on that we so made not, those adjustments. not private roads then. Correct. Okay. There um, might be a few, uh, full disclosure, the townhomes could very well have a couple of private drives. Okay. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? parcel in the far southeast corner that's not part of your development? That's part of the railroad easement. That little, the little notch, notch, yes, okay. correct, sir. So that's railroad property? Yes. Okay. Um, and then my last question is um, a uh, railroad crossing at the south end of Chestnut there, where, what's the status of that? Is that in negotiations with the railroad company is that approved that's outside of the scope of what we're looking at doing uh, because they own that land and we would only be we're, we would be uh, building out half of a hundred foot um, arterial right away um, along that area but we would stop short just because we would not be in control of that land any issues with that from a city engineering standpoint dead end street so we did have some of those preliminary conversations. Um, yes, we would want that to be an arterial road, so planning 
Planning forward, yes, we want a 100-foot right-of-way. Um, it's probably not going to be built to an arterial design standard. You know, they could probably build it as a local street standard, and it would be just fine until it's worn out and it develops um, the adjacent property. So doing that, but yeah, they would probably have to put in some kind of a temporary turnaround or cul-de-sac or something there. Well, I saw it was a 100-foot right-of-way in lieu of a narrower than normal. Mm -hmm. I was concerned with the one and a half lanes, candidly, that's there and wanted two full travel lanes, um, especially to serve all the residents that are going to be living in that area. So that's why we made it wider. I have a question for Tammy. Uh, with all this construction going on, all these new homes and townhouses, is the sewer line that it's going to run into big enough, or do we have to expand on that? So as it sits right now, this, the city cannot provide sewer to this uh, development. So what they're going to do is put in a private lift station, and then that lift station will pump to our golf course lift station, and then that will go underneath the river, and it goes through our system to Sioux Falls. And so they are upfronting that cost for that lift station. Okay. I would also add that this area provides for a future gravity feed sewer trunk line that would fit the use uh, for future expansion. And it's all, uh, well, it mostly runs along that um, railroad uh, line that right. the city would be under, in control of. Big picture planning, we would ideally put a big lift station kind of by McCarty Park. And then that would also um, gravity feed um, upstream so that we would be able to get rid of a couple of our lift stations. But in order to do that, there's quite a bit of growth that would have to happen before we could afford something like that. And there's other lines that would have to be upsized. So it's a process. So this is listed as a discussion item. Are we taking action on this tonight? Just nope, so on concept plans, it's only discussion items. So after this, it'll go to city council and then they'll have a chance to get the developer um, comments and feedback. After that, then they'll go into preliminary plans and preliminary plans is where you have to make a formal approval or denial. Um, one last question um, with that L-shaped R3 zone there. Uh, are you looking at access off of Aspen into that? Or is it all coming from the east and the west? So the traffic study um, that we've done and we're talking to HDR, um, the, the, the request ultimately will be uh, right in, right out uh, in that L-shaped area. And then there will be a D-cell lane shouldn't sound so definitive, but what the game plan <laughs> is, is to have two D-cell lanes um, to handle uh, the volume of traffic, one coming in for Country Club, and then one also at Chestnut. And then there would be um, another apartment access then off of Chestnut. So no other access off Aspen? One additional is, is going to be requested, okay. but it would be real close. Battery stay. Oh. <laughs> So do we, do we grant that access off Aspen, or does the state have to do that? So that is kind of a tricky subject, because right now it is county jurisdiction. There we go. The county would have to give access. Now, if they annex it in, technically, as it sits now, the agreement is that the city takes over that right away, so that jurisdiction will be on us. So it's kind of both of us. Okay. Yeah, I, it, it will, I, I would be opposed to uh, access into the uh, into the R three off of Aspen. Okay. I I would prefer to see it coming off of Chestnut. And I mean, whatever, it's whatever that other road well, it's is. mostly for the commercial on on the corner, um, just for people getting we've got quite a bit of interest from the convenience store, so getting people in and out of there easily would be the the goal. Um, the reason why we put that other street um, just west of the R3 was for the main access into um, 
the multifamily site. And, and again, the, the reason behind the L shape there was to get a more attractive clubhouse look um, along Aspen Drive and then the, and the buildings um, was the reason for that. And, uh, you know, c kind of keep your density closer to the intersection, the commercial, and then, you know, our density kind of drops as, as we enter into the community. Okay, anybody else have any questions? Go ahead. I see four cul-de-sacs here. Cul-de-sacs, we, we can sometimes be concerned about them. They cost a lot more than other streets for snow removal, a lot more. And also, we get a lot of variance requests from people who live on cul-de-sacs because they're the narrowest part of the lot is the frontage. Then when people want to build a, a side pad for their boat or they want to make their driveway bigger or something, they can't do it because of the setbacks. And then we have to say no to people. Um, create some problems. I personally think they might be a safety problem your kids choking and or your kitchens on fire and you're trying to get ambulance and car police cars and uh, what were fire trucks in there and I don't like to see them myself I just wanted to say that well thank you for your comment you bet Okay. Anybody else have anything? I, let me, if you don't mind, let sure. me address the the comment just a little bit. Um, makes you feel any better? We just took two cul de sacs out, um, <laughs> um, which uh, then developed into this southeast corner. We do have some limitations. You know, our company um, we really believe in enriching uh, people's livelihoods through smart development, and. We try to balance all of our sites, um, make sure that we're not trucking dirt here and there. Uh, the other thing, there's some wetlands that have been, de de been delineated uh, that exist there that kind of create that um, green space as you see it. So it really gives a kind of a dead end for some of those lots to be able to come in and thus forces a couple of those cul-de-sacs that exist there on the south. Um, the grade change that exists um, up in that more northern cul-de-sac um, would make a, a through road a little more challenging. Uh, I'll also throw, I happen to live on a cul-de-sac um, and one of, my, one of the things that I notice is people seem to drive a lot more cautiously when they're in a cul-de-sac. Kids will play out in the streets, a lot more basketball being played than it is on the, the main thoroughfare. Um, plus, if you live around 16, 17 year old drivers, they seem to like to go as fast as they can down straightaways. Okay. Do um, you guys have anything else over there? Any concerns or thoughts? No? And we don't have any other questions up here? I assume the institution will be um, handed over to the city upon completion. That sure is my goal. Yeah. With a splash park and pickleball courts, and I'm sure there'll be some type of crusher fine trail of some sort through there for people to be able to walk and stuff. It, it belongs to the city and for the residents to the east side of Brandon. Okay. Anything else? No? Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item number 13, stormwater management features. That sounds interesting. So this is the latest revamp of our ongoing conversation about stormwater detention facilities. This one takes it out of being a principal use and kind of treats it like 
we treat landscaping and every other additional use kind of thing. It has design that would, if it is intended to be a stormwater management facility, it wouldn't apply to things that could be but aren't designed to be, and it would be need to be designed correctly and approved by the city engineer. It would be designed to be integrated into landscaping and if there's any above ground structures or anything incorporated into it those wouldn't be limited by the accessory building number limitation and maintenance i used i added unless otherwise approved by the city engineer to the start of the second sentence on there just because things happen that's beyond our control so just a strict failure to maintain might be periodically an issue Sure. Say some, we get some kind of weather event or it might be beyond their control and just to be slapped down with a violation might be the wrong way to go. Okay. So I'm open to your thoughts. Hopefully we're more in the right direction than we were last time. Anybody have any ideas on this or thoughts on this? Tammy, you're good with this? If this is redundant or unnecessary, we can certainly. Because I'm, I'm trying to think where, where does this apply to the rest of our work? Because I know we spent several meetings talking about BMPs, uh, but this has no correlation to BMPs. So why do we... So why are we putting a small piece of it in the ordinance but not the all-inclusive piece of it? I'm, 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 I'm kind of confused here. I'm sorry. I, I need some clarification. So let me ask, what what was the intent of writing this ordinance? So it started off with the conversation that you, we do have lots in the city that are just BMP facilities, whether it be a detention basin, retention basin, what have you. We do have those lots. Some are in the industrial park and there are others you can drive around town and find them. It started from the perspective of in order to be on a lot you need to be somehow an allowed use on the lot. Whether that's a principal use listed as a permitted or conditional use or it's treated somehow 
otherwise. We started off at it being something in one of those lists and we talked about the districts we should have them that became very complicated and there'd be a lot to sort out. So this goes the approach that they can conceptually be wherever they are. We would just treat them kind of like landscaping instead of a principal use. We treat them as an additional thing, not necessarily that. But whether this is the right or wrong approach, I am open to your thoughts. I, I have two people that are have more expertise than I do in this. So I, we're just trying to give these a space on the land. They're already covered under the design standards as to what and how they function. This is just giving them space to live, essentially. So the fact that they're not all defined isn't necessarily a problem because we already have them defined in our design standards. Okay. Okay, any other questions? No? Then what's the next move on this? We have a public hearing. If this is the language you want, we're certainly, we, we can craft it as you want it. I just want to know if, if this is how you want it, if there are any tweaks we need to make to it. i just looking for some finalization comments. If there are serious flaws, it's best to address them before it's a problem we have to deal with. Okay. Well, again, I'm, I'm confused with this and the intent and where, where it's going. So. So, a property owner comes to the city, they're going to put in some stormwater management practices, okay? Now all of a sudden, we have to go through all this rigmarole to let them put in a retention pond? Because this now applies to any and everything. The what we talked about before was publicly owned. This now addresses everybody. So, for example, Lee Schilling, his new development that they're putting in on, on Redwood. Now, he's. are we saying he now has to apply with this as well? He's over one acre. He has to put in something. He has to put in some water. I understand that. But that's not a public facility. Last time we talked about publicly owned BMPs. There's also privately owned BMPs and they can be above ground, below ground, they can be all kinds of things. Not just retention ponds. But this this isn't addressed in institutional. Is my point. This is this is any and everything. Because we're no, nowhere else in the code does this say this only applies to institutional. What we just passed applies to institutional, but this this terminology does not. Is that making sense? One solution we could potentially approach is instead of. A being design requirements, we could make a applicability and we could define what it specifically applies to. And if we need to in the design requirements, we could add a, another number and rearrange them. If it's one plus acres, it complies. We can slice it how you want to what it applies to. I need a little direction there, though. Where do we I'm trying I'm trying to make sense of this now. Where do we slice it if it's intended to be institutional or is institutional and if it's or if it is privately owned and greater than an acre, is that where we slice it? Well, 
All right, so we do have privately owned BMPs that have not been turned over to the city of Brandon? Yes. Okay. So if we included those in some sort of language here that these rules are for institutional or if these, because I don't see that in here either, basically stating that these are for something specific. Well, I don't know. That's why I asked. If it's covered by the design standards, we might not. Okay. Well, I mean, if we already have this covered under our design standards, and it seems like we're writing an ordinance for, I don't know why we're writing an ordinance. I always believe, state it once, don't duplicate it, because when you change it one place and you forget to change it in another place, so to me, if this is in the design standards, then let's leave it in the design standards. Otherwise, we end up with the design standards change, these don't change, and then we have conflicting information, or vice versa. Yes. I mean, I, I, I understand the, the reasoning and the requirements for you know, the engineering behind stormwater management. But I, I don't know if that should be in here or if it should stay in the design standards. Well, we did just pass the design standards, am I correct? Yeah. And these are all covered under that? Um, and he is probably right, because those of us who have been here long enough remember abutting and adjacent and having to go through that mess with the ordinance. So if we can avoid that, if at all possible, and it's already covered, then yeah, I'm trying, I don't know why, I don't, I'm not sure why we would, unless you can, have a, bet, a good reason why we need an ordinance for this. Because, I mean, we've, we've, we've revised the ordinance to allow it as a principal use. Okay. Which would be a separate parcel with just a BMP. Now, if somebody wants to come in and they develop a, a property, um, you know, say a sunshine comes in, over an acre lot and they want to develop it, they would still have to follow the, the design standards. Yes. And still have to go through that. Um, but that would be privately owned. Okay. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that or is everybody equally confused? I agree it's best to avoid redundancy um, if people are required to put in stormwater management in our design standards, then yeah, we probably don't need this language. I don't, I don't know, unless there's a better reason. And if you want to think on that, Patrick, you're more than welcome. I'm just, so hopefully the laws the city writes in different places are consistent. <laughs> That's always the goal. Yeah. I'm just trying to think, is there a way it could be interpreted as the design standards go to engineering, zoning goes to Paul, Melissa, and I? Would there be a way where it could get approved under engineering, but looking at a zoning perspective, it would not be? Is there some kind of conflict? Do we need to add a line that in the zoning ordinance that BMPs or stormwater management features are subject to the design standards? Is that a way to make it that clear cut? That seems like a lot of really clear language there. So Instead is that of, all it takes? Yes. Is just a reference that way they don't necessarily conflict that zoning says nothing, therefore you can interpret it as it says nothing, so therefore it's prohibited. I don't know. So we, we probably need to address it, but we probably need to address it just simply like you just did. I mean, yeah, it's kind of like line in the additional use, or maybe we could put it in the landscaping standards. Well, well, even in our landscaping in. standards, we have a catch-all with xeriscaping that basically says it has to go through an engineer, engineer approval. Yep. We don't define exactly what xeriscaping is because it's too much to define, right. basically. Mm -hmm. So, we could probably treat this in a similar manner. Do we want to scrap it? Do we want a one-liner in the zoning? What do we think um, is more? If, if you think it needs to be addressed in the zoning, then I think a one-liner would probably suffice. 
something that just basically addresses the design standards. The really eloquent sentence you just said that I can't remember sounded great. Okay. And it would, to me, it should go in all, all of our zoning districts. Sure. I mean, you probably wouldn't ever have it in an R1 or an R2, but you could possibly in an R3, where they would be required to have a private, if you had a large enough apartment complex. Okay. Is that good? Are we good? We can move on to building permits. Item number 14. Not even going to say it tonight, Paul. Not gonna say. I'm not gonna say anything. Just hey, it looks good. Charts. Yep. Build. Looks great. There's lots of names on here. Lots of names. You look busy. Yeah. I think. So, the. Next meeting, at the last meeting, we had talked about if you wanted to require any kind of notices for concept and preliminary plans. Is that something you would like to discuss at a future meeting? The kind of like we do the 300 foot notices to neighbors, is that something you, you expressed an interest last time before we put it on the agenda? I just wanted to make sure that was your intent. I'll open it up for discussion. Oh, hold on just a second. Yeah, I think uh, our discussion was that if there's if there's enough that builders are going to be putting an infrastructure before we go to rezoning, and they're given a green light to do so, then that that should be open to public hearing. If 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 developers, you know, what, whatever point it is that developers are are given a green light by the city to to do something. Before they do that, it's not fair to them to say, "Yeah, you can go ahead and put in an infrastructure," and then we come back and deny a rezoning. I That's don't not, think so that they can. I mean, they're assuming at okay. that point. Well, and I, I don't, yeah. I don't know what what yeah. we're. Go ahead, Timmy. After the preliminary plan is approved by both P and Z and Council, that's when we allow them to do their grading permit. So that's not infrastructure. All they can do is move dirt, and that is at their own risk because they know that the development engineering plans have not been approved. We would not approve the development engineering plans until the rezone and everything has gone through. As long as they, they are fully aware that any infrastructure that has to change, right? Yes. You know, it's fully at their own risk. Yep. So my concern for the, for the ones that we do send a notice out, you're also required to post something on the property for a um, preliminary plan. We're not required to post anything on the property. So unless somebody is actively monitoring either social media or the city's website, they're not going to know about this. So um, I would like to see either we change it so it's posted on the property that you know, this area is subject to a preliminary plan for review and comment um, or we send this out. Because otherwise, otherwise the public isn't going to know about it. So do preliminary plans, can they only be submitted if a, if a, if a parcel is annexed already into the city? No. Okay. So with the other ones, we do recall we only send it out to people who are actually in the city limits. So if there's parcels outside of the city limits that we're hearing preliminary plans on, they're not really even a part of the city yet. The variance in conditional use 300 foot notices do not specify in city. Only rezones? The rezones do. Why didn't we do that for conditional uses and variances? If that's a change you want to make, we can go that route, but that language is currently only in the rezone. Okay. I've written and signed and sent every one of those. <laughs> I know. I think that should be. <laughs> I'm aware but of that. But, but if we're going to, I mean, well, if we're. Got an now, yeah. Because we've got no blood yeah. I guess I, I, 
I wouldn't want to see in it. And usually it's on the edge of town, so we're probably not talking a lot of people. You know, if it was in the middle of town, which we typically don't see blueberry. An example would be Although, the Aspen Ridge we just talked about. So for their eventual rezone that'll be coming your way early July, I sent it to 10 neighbors, and those were the ones northeast, kind of east of the golf course. They, those were in 400 feet. That doesn't include east or south or west, because not in the city. Anybody else have any opinions on this? I think variance and conditional use requests should be in city people only, same as rezoning. Okay. How about the preliminary plans? Uh, I, I don't have strong feelings one way or another about that. Um, how, how, uh, so we, I know we just reviewed concept plans, which can certainly change at any time. When we approve a preliminary plan, how much can that change between the time that we approve it and the time they build it? I base the DEPs off of it, so can't. they can't. They okay. have to start the process over. Okay. So are we going to send out notices to concept plans as well? One thing to note about concept and preliminary plans, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we do not charge fees for those. We don't. If we start accumulating costs on our end by writing letters and sending them, we would probably have to start charging fees for those. Well, yeah. I agree there, too. Oh, I, have, I don't know. I have a... I don't... I think it shouldn't be sent out because I don't know. Just don't think. Okay. I think you're just going to get a lot more rebuttal against because people don't want stuff happening. I honestly think in this town, we've seen it time and time again. And I'm not against people knowing stuff. I'm just against people trying to stop stuff from happening in this town. And it goes from here to city council, and people start bending their knee very quickly for this public to just go, okay, three people are saying they don't want it. Okay, we'll listen to those three people out of the 11,000 people that live in this town. And they have enough time to come in here to see things happening, I think, before the preliminary plan or the concept plan to see things happening in this town. And, they know something's going to start happening outside of town because all the little spots that are not developed, there's going to be something happening there eventually. They should know that it's going to happen. But that's my thought. Uh, the only hesitation I'd have with it is the other cases where we talked about this, we were building off of an established where we were already, the city was already having to advertise and post. We expanded that and we added letters, right? This seems like a whole new mechanism, so that's that might become problematic. Is then is there going to be a problem that we now are sending letters, but we're not yeah. advertising? I don't want to open a can of worms there necessarily. The others were easier because we we're building off an established process, and I think making it better and getting a more actually informing the public, whereas you know people miss the signs and they don't, you know, myself included, don't always read the things that are published in the paper. So I, I like those a lot more than this. And I guess my only <clears throat> thing is if we can have those discussions sooner, if there's some things that we can change in the preliminary process before it gets to council, and then the council is left to pass or deny, that's, they, they don't have a lot of options once it gets to them, it's either pass or deny. If we can solve an issue before it gets to them, that's kind of what our job is. So there's, a, there's, I think there's been a lot of issues that if the right questions would have been asked at the right time, there could have been a resolution instead of a, a brick wall kind of deal. So, and 
maybe it caused more problem than it solved. I don't know, but that would be that that'd be the the benefit of it yeah. is that you could get some of those questions answered. And I'm not against people knowing what's going on in this town at all. I mean, they should know. I mean, just use this as an example. This property. I mean, it's maybe a. I mean, I drive by it. There's signs all through the ditch saying something's happening there. All them people up in the golf course, the east side of Brandon, should know something's going to happen on this property sometime down the road. I mean, I know not everybody puts a sign out, but they have. And even north, the was that Chestnut, the new development up there. I mean, they had a didn't they have a meeting with the uh, neighborhood to say, hey, this is what we're doing. And I, to me, that's not every developer does that, but a lot of the, I don't know if I want to say good ones, but a lot of the more trying to be proactive on it do that. They try to go meet with neighbors and say, hey, this is what our concept is, what's your concerns. We'll try to beat that before we get to the city. They try to do that, I mean, before they get to us. Yeah. Um, I will also say that the people sitting at this table are the ones who are supposed to be the zoning experts right like a lot of the questions we should know when a when a developer comes in we should be able to look at them and say this is now public input is always fantastic it's fantastic all the time we get it a lot um, and we should listen to it but ultimately we're we're the ones that are sitting here to make decisions but if if those questions aren't asked to us what does the council have to look at when it gets to them if we haven't addressed them? We could vote yay or nay on something without a lot of discussion, and the city council has, if we don't, if we don't have the discussion, they don't have anything to say, yeah, I agree with that or I disagree with that. If the public comes up with just one side and says we oppose it because of this, and this group hasn't had any input, then the council is only left with the conversation that was at the council. So if, if, the, if the discussion isn't here and we don't get to say, well, the ordinance says this and this and that and whatever else, everything else, if that discussion isn't made, the council is at the mercy of the people that come to the meeting and are against it. They can't look at the video and say, the <clears throat> planning and zoning had a really good reason for yay or nay and we're going to stick with that they're left with we don't know why they said it and but we know why the public's against it so, so that's that's the only, that's yeah. the biggest reason for the the conversation here yep. instead of that council so we do have those conversations and council is encouraged before every meeting to watch the planning and zoning meetings so that they can try and understand the discussions do they all watch them i don't know there's no discussion here at all. Sometimes they miss that meeting and it gets the council before. Is, I, so, anyway, I, yep. that's, that's I, my opinion I, for more uh, awareness before it gets to the council. Yep. So those conversations can happen here. And, and information is, is fantastic. We've done a great job in the city of promoting more and more of it at all times. Um, I will tell you, however, that a few years ago when we were having some water issues with people overwatering lawns, a gentleman came to me and said, why didn't anybody tell me I couldn't water my lawn? I said, well, it was on Facebook. Well, I'm not on Facebook. I said it was in Textedly. Well, we didn't, I don't have that. It was in your water bill that comes to your house every month. Well, I don't read that. I said it was in the paper. Well, I don't get the paper. I said, what would you like us to do more to get you information? Right. Our, our form of government is based on an educated public. Yep. And, you know, you can lead a horse to walk. I mean, that's why, by law, we have to publish the minutes. That's why, by law, we have to make the agenda public. And yep. by law, we have to um, have open meetings. All that, the law says we have to be open like that. We, and we have to follow the law, too. There's nowhere in our laws 
that says that we decide things based on people's opinions. It's all based on the law. We have to follow it. But people should, there's, there comes a time when people should educate themselves. They, you know, if they can't afford the paper, it's at the library, it's online. If, if they don't, I mean, should read the minutes once in a while. I, when I ran the paper, I used to put headlines on top of the minutes to try to draw people in. The, they have to be, people have to be responsible and pay attention because our whole form of government is based on an elected, no, not a, an educated electorate. electorate. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. You have to participate in order for it all to work. And that means maybe coming to the meetings, you know, or watching them on line and in, in educating yourself and informing yourself and we're doing is you know everything by law to make sure that people know and even more so oh god I thought you were going to come up start talking my, my, I guess my concern with my comment Whew. is that yes I, I agree with all that yes we need to be educated however what actually happens is people aren't aware of it until they see a sign posted, yep. that bright sign sitting out there, rezone, conditional use, variance, or they get a letter in the mail. The problem with our process is, and we kind of got chastised a little bit a few meetings ago, when we had already approved a preliminary layout, preliminary plan that had zoning changes and we approved we had already yeah, gave sure. gave the thumbs up to that well the next meeting when they come for the the zoning the, the next step in it the zoning change that's when everybody showed up because they weren't aware of what was going on but yet we were told well you guys already approved it well how do you think the people in the audience took that so my point is with a conditional use, with a variance, with a rezone, letters go out, things are posted on the property, and then and that gets people's attention. Well, if we've already got a step that pre precedes that, that these people aren't aware of, I'd rather I'd rather we send out the letter for a a preliminary plan than a rezone because that's already addressed. So I I, I don't want us to process something through the through us or the city, and then the public gets aware of a, of a rezone. And I do agree with that. Because, you know, just taking Van Buskirk, for instance, if that doesn't pass that second reading, now he has to start over. So paying, the point of having the preliminary plans is so that the developer doesn't have to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars into engineering fees just to get told no. So the preliminary plans are pretty important that's the one that gives them the green light to work with city staff and do what needs to get done to finish their development because if that second reading gets um, denied now they can't start work or anything best case would be September so they're not working and finishing that this year so they've gone through the whole process and had no fault of theirs now it's going to get denied and now they have to pay for that engineering to be restarted they have to replat it they have those filing fees at the county has to go through the whole process. They have to pay for that rezoning again. It does protect the developer a little bit too. If we can get through all of those conversations at the preliminary plan, once that preliminary plan is approved, then we can move forward and finish it off. I don't have any objections to sending out letters for preliminary plans. I just, you know, I don't, I don't anybody know who's listening, <laughs> anybody who's listening, we, please. Maybe we should post something like we did yeah. for the other things on the site. That Some of that problem is, is like this one is 93 acres. Where are you going to post a sign that anybody's going to be able to read it? That's not the size of the for sale signs that are sitting there now. How big are they, Paul? Four two by eight. Two foot by two foot? Yeah. Yeah. 
And I know that people know that these things are going to happen, but they they happen really slowly and then really quickly. Right. And they could be sitting there, you know, paying attention, like, oh, I know something's going to happen, I know something's going to And then they miss two weeks and all of a sudden it's done. And they don't have their chance for input. We send out a letter. We're not sending out letters for these kind of developments like weekly. Once the once it's done, then it's done. So we're we're talking about, you know, a huge development that the people around it know. And most of the time, like this one, there isn't any one really around it that's gonna be affected, so it's not a big deal. But when there are those people affected and they feel like they're they're being ignored. We don't want people to feel like they're being ignored. That's they they should have the opportunity to have the input at the right time. If if they're only given the chance for input after actions have been taken, they really don't like that. Yeah, I'm saying there are plenty of chances before. However, well, well, and, okay, well, what I'm plenty of chances though? Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Not covered, but I've, I've been, I've followed the city government. There I've you go. followed the city government for. We just had one too many on. Oh, okay. Sorry. I followed city government for the last 40 years, and I can't tell you un, uncountable times where people have come in after the fact, partly because they don't pay attention on their own. Seeing at, you know, having said that, I would say, I got, I have no objections for what you're suggesting. I don't have any, I don't have any objections. I'm just encouraging people, anybody who's listening to this, you have to be proactive on your end too. You have to be. And there are lots and lots of checks and balances in place, set up by the government, by our form of government, so that you have plenty, plenty opportunities to be able to follow your city, county, state, national government. There's plenty of opportunities that you can take advantage of, and a lot of people don't. And they should. Okay. Yep. <laughs> that was all. It was. But you're loud, so we heard you. Yeah, yeah. Nobody ever accused me of this. I don't know if we solved anything. Are you good? Yeah. We'll talk as staff and see what we would need to do to at least present some language and we can talk about it and see if that's so my ultimate goal is whatever makes your guys' lives easier, I am in favor of. I don't want more work bestowed upon you for sending out letters. If you said that, that adds 40 hours to my week, I, I, right? But if you do say that by doing this, it, it, it takes some of the burden off of something, then I would say yes. Even if it was a preliminary plan where a rezone is going to be required or something. I don't know. Just, just something where, if, if the right information isn't, or the right opportunity isn't given at the right time, and we end up with the situation we did a couple weeks ago. If we can avoid that, that's all I'm looking for. Okay. You good? Well, that being said, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Sorry. Motion and a second to adjourn. We all in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned at 8.03.